The dinner passed off quietly. Freya sat facing her father, calm but pale. Heemskirk affected to talk only to old Nelson. Jasper's behavior was exemplary. He kept his eyes under control, basking in the sense of Freya's nearness, as people bask in the sun without looking up to heaven. And very soon, after dinner was over, mindful of his instructions, he declared that it was time for him to go on board his ship. Heemskirk did not look up. Ensconced in the rocking chair and puffing at a chirote, he had the air of meditating surlily over some odious outbreak. So at least it seemed to Freya. Old Nelson said at once, I'll stroll down with you. He had begun a professional conversation about the dangers of the New Guinea coast and wanted to relate to Jasper some experiences of his own over there. Jasper was such a good listener. Freya made as if to accompany them, but her father frowned, shook his head, and nodded significantly towards the immovable heemskirk blotting out smoke with half-closed eyes and protruding lips. The lieutenant must not be left alone. Take offense, perhaps. Freya obeyed these signs. Perhaps it is better for me to stay, she thought. Women are not generally prone to review their own conduct, still less to condemn it. The embarrassing masculine absurdities are in the main responsible for its ethics. But looking at Heemskirk, Freya felt regret and even remorse. His thick bulk and repose suggested the idea of repletion. But as a matter of fact, he had eaten very little. He had drunk a great deal, however. The fleshy lobes of his unpleasant big ears with deeply folded rims were crimson. They quite flamed in the neighborhood of the flat, sallow cheeks. For a considerable time, he did not raise his heavy brown eyelids. To be at the mercy of such a creature was humiliating, and Freya, who always ended by being frank with herself, thought regretfully, if only I had been open with Papa from the first. But then, what an impossible life he would have led me. Yes, men were absurd in many ways. Lovably like Jasper, impractically like her father, odiously like that grotesque, supine creature in the chair. Was it possible to talk him over? Perhaps it was not necessary. Oh, I can't talk to him, she thought, and when Heemskirk, still without looking at her, began resolutely to crush his half-smoked cheroot on the coffee tray, she took alarm, glided towards the piano, opened it in tremendous haste, and struck the keys before she sat down. In an instant, the veranda, the whole carpetless wooden bungalow, raised on piles, became filled with an uproarious, confused resonance. But through it all, she heard, she felt on the floor, the heavy, prowling footsteps of the lieutenant, moving to and fro at her back. He was not exactly drunk, but he was sufficiently primed to make the suggestions of his excited imagination seem perfectly feasible and even clever, beautifully, unscrupulously clever. Freya, aware that he had stopped just behind her, went on playing without turning her head. She played with spirit, brilliantly, a fierce piece of music. But when his voice reached her, she went cold, all over. It was the voice, not the words. The insolent familiarity of tone dismayed her to such an extent that she could not understand at first what he was saying. His utterance was thick, too. I suspected, of course I suspected something of your little goings-on. I am not a child, but from suspecting to seeing, seeing, you understand, there is an enormous difference. That sort of thing. Come. One isn't made of stone, 
And when a man has been worried by a girl, as I have been worried by you, Miss Freya, sleeping and waking, then of course, but I am a man of the world. I must be dull for you here. I say, won't you leave off this confounded playing? This last was the only sentence she really made out. She shook her head negatively, and in desperation put on the loud pedal, but she could not make the sound of the piano cover his raised voice. Only I am surprised that you should. An English trading skipper, a common fellow, low, cheeky lot, infesting these islands. I would make short work of such trash, while you have here a good friend, a gentleman ready to worship at your feet, your pretty feet, an officer, a man of family. Strange, isn't it? But what of that? You are fit for a prince. Freya did not turn her head. Her face went stiff with horror and indignation. This adventure was altogether beyond her conception of what was possible. It was not in her character to jump up and run away. It seemed to her, too, that if she did move, there was no saying what might happen. Presently, her father would be back, and then the other would have to leave off. It was best to ignore, to ignore. She went on, playing loudly and correctly, as though she were alone, as if Heemskirk did not exist. That proceeding irritated him. Come, you may deceive your father, he bawled angrily, but I am not to be made a fool of. Stop this infernal noise, Freya. Hey, you Scandinavian goddess of love, stop. Do you hear me? That's what you are, of love. But the heathen gods are only devils in disguise. And that's what you are, too, a deep little devil. Stop it, I say, or I will lift you off that stool. Standing behind her, he devoured her with his eyes, from the golden crown of her rigidly motionless head to the heels of her shoes, the line of her shapely shoulders, the curves of her fine figure swaying a little before the keyboard. She had on a light dress, the sleeves stopped short at the elbows in an edging of lace, a satin ribbon encircled her waist. In an access of irresistible, reckless hopefulness, he clapped both his hands on that waist, and then the irritating music stopped at last. But quick as she was springing away from the contact, the music stool going over with a crash, Hingskirk's lips, aiming at her neck, landed a hungry, smacking kiss. A deep silence reigned for a time, and then he laughed rather feebly. He was disconcerted somewhat by her white, still face, the big, light, violet eyes, resting on him stunnily. She had not uttered a sound. She faced him, steadying herself, on the corner of the piano, with one extended hand. The other went on rubbing, with mechanical persistency, the place his lips had touched. What's the trouble, he said, offended. Startled you? Look here, don't let us have any of that nonsense. You don't mean to say a kiss frightens you so much as all that. I know better. I don't mean to be left out in the cold. He had been gazing into her face with such strained intentness that he could no longer see it distinctly. Everything round him was rather misty. He forgot the overturned stool, caught his foot against it, and lurched forward slightly, saying in an ingratiating tone. I'm not bad fun, really. You try a few kisses to begin with. He said no more, because his head received a terrific concussion accompanied by an explosive sound. Freya had swung her round, strong arm with such force that the impact of her open palm on his flat cheek turned him half round, uttering a faint, 
hoarse yell. The lieutenant clapped both hands to the left side of his face, which had taken on, suddenly, a dusky brick-red tinge. Freya, very erect, her violet eyes darkened, her palms still tingling from the blow, a sort of restrained, determined smile showing a tiny gleam of her white teeth, heard her father's rapid, heavy tread on the path below the veranda. Her expression lost its pugnacity and became sincerely concerned. She was sorry for her father. She stooped quickly to pick up the music stool, as if anxious to obliterate the traces. But that was no good. She had resumed her attitude, one hand resting lightly on the piano, before old Nelson got up to the top of the stairs. Poor father, how furious he will be, how upset. And afterwards, what tremors, what unhappiness. Why had she not been open with him from the first? His round, innocent stare of amazement cut her to the quick, but he was not looking at her. His stare was directed at Heemskirk, who, with his back to him, with his hands still up to his face, was hissing curses through his teeth, and she saw him in profile, glaring at her balefully with one black, evil eye. "'What's the matter?' asked old Nelson, very much bewildered. She did not answer him. She thought of Jasper on the deck of the brig, gazing up at the lighted bungalow, and she felt frightened. It was a mercy that one of them at least was on board out of the way. She only wished he were a hundred miles off, and yet she was not certain that she did. Had Jasper been mysteriously moved that moment to reappear on the veranda, she would have thrown her consistency, her firmness, her self-possession to the winds and flown into his arms. What is it? What is it? insisted the unsuspecting Nelson, getting quite excited. Only this minute you were playing a tune, and... Freya, unable to speak, in her apprehension of what was coming, she was also fascinated by that black, evil, glaring eye, only nodded slightly at the lieutenant, as much as to say, just look at him. Why, yes, exclaimed old Nelson, I see. What on earth? Meantime, he had cautiously approached Team Skirk, who, bursting into incoherent imprecations, was stamping with both feet where he stood. The indignity of the blow, the rage of baffled purpose, the ridicule of the exposure, and the impossibility of revenge maddened him to a point when he simply felt he must howl with fury. Oh, 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 he howled, stamping across the veranda as though he meant to drive his foot through the floor at every step. Why is his face hurt? asked the astounded old Nelson. The truth dawned suddenly upon his innocent mind. Dear me, he cried, enlightened. Get some brandy, quick, Freya. You are subject to it, Lieutenant. Fiendish, eh? I know, I know. I used to go crazy all of a sudden myself in the time. And the little bottle of laudanum from the medicine chest too, Freya. Look sharp. Don't you see he's got a toothache? And indeed, what other explanation could have presented itself to the guileless old Nelson, beholding this cheek nursed with both hands, these wild glances, these stampings, this distracted swing of the body? It would have demanded a preternatural acuteness to hit upon the true cause. Freya had not moved. She watched Heemskirk's savagely inquiring black stare directed stealthily upon herself. Aha, you would like to be off, she said to herself. She looked at him unflinchingly, thinking it out. The temptation of making an end of it all without further trouble was irresistible. 
she gave an almost imperceptible nod of assent and glided away. Hurry up that brandy, old Nelson shouted as she disappeared in the passage. Heemskirk relieved his deeper feelings by a sudden string of curses in Dutch and English, which he sent after her. He raved to her heart's content, flinging to and fro the veranda and kicking chairs out of his way, while Nelson, whose sympathy was profoundly stirred by these evidences of agonizing pain, hovered round his dear and dreaded lieutenant, fussing like an old hen. Dear me, dear me, is it so bad? I know well what it is. I used to frighten my poor wife sometimes. Do you get it often like this, lieutenant? Heemskirk shouldered him viciously out of the way with a short, insane laugh. But his staggering host took it in good part. A man beside himself with excruciating toothache is not responsible. Go into my room, lieutenant, he suggested urgently. Throw yourself on my bed. We will get something to ease you in a minute. He seized the poor sufferer by the arm and forced him gently outwards to the very bed on which Heemskirk, in a renewed access of rage, flung himself down with such force that it rebounded from the mattress to the height of quite a foot. Dear me, exclaimed the scared Nelson, and incontinently ran off to hurry up the brandy and the laudanum very angry that so little alacrity was shown in relieving the tortures of his precious guest. In the end, he got these things himself. Half an hour later, he stood in the inner passage of the house, surprised by faint, spasmodic sounds of a mysterious nature between laughter and sobs. He frowned, then went straight towards his daughter's room and knocked at the door. Freya, her glorious fair hair framing her white face and rippling down a dark blue dressing gown, opened it partly. The light in the room was dim. Antonia, crouching in a corner, rocked herself backwards and forwards, uttering feeble moans. Old Nelson had not much experience in various kinds of feminine laughter but he was certain there had been laughter there. Very unfeeling, very unfeeling, he said with weighty displeasure. What is there so amusing in a man being in pain? I should have thought a woman, a young girl. He was so funny, murmured Freya, whose eyes glistened strangely in the semi-obscurity of the passage. And then, you know, I don't like him, she added in an unsteady voice. Funny, repeated old Nelson, amazed at this evidence of callousness in one so young. You don't like him? Do you mean to say that because you don't like him, why, why, it's simply cruel. Don't you know it's about the worst sort of pain there is? Dogs have been known to go mad with it. He certainly seemed to have gone mad, Freya said with an effort, as if she were struggling with some hidden feeling. But her father was launched. And you know how he is. He notices everything. He is a fellow to take offense for the least little thing. Regular Dutchman. And I want to keep friendly with him. It's like this, my girl. If that Raja of ours were to do something silly, and you know he is a sulky, rebellious beggar, and the authorities took into their heads that my influence over him wasn't good, you would find yourself without a roof over your head. She cried, What nonsense, father, in a not very assured tone, and discovered that he was angry, angry enough to achieve irony. Yes, old Nelson, irony, just a gleam of it. Oh, of course, if you have means of your own, a mansion, a plantation, that I know nothing of, but he was not capable of sustained irony. I tell you, they would bundle me out of here, he whispered forcibly, without compensation, of course. I know these Dutch. And the lieutenant's just the fellow to start the trouble going. 
He has the ear of influential officials. I wouldn't offend him for anything, for anything, on no consideration whatever. What did you say? It was only an inarticulate exclamation. If she ever had a half-formed intention of telling him everything, she had given it up now. It was impossible, both out of regard for his dignity and for the peace of his poor mind. I don't care for him myself very much, old Nelson's subdued undertone confessed in a sigh. He's easier now, he went on after a silence. I've given him up my bed for the night. I shall sleep on my veranda in the hammock. No, I can't say I like him either. But from that to laugh at a man because he's driven crazy with pain is a long way. You've surprised me, Freya. That side of his face is quite flushed. Her shoulders shook convulsively under his hands, which he laid on her paternally. His straggly, wiry mustache brushed her forehead in a goodnight kiss. She closed the door and went away from it to the middle of the room before she allowed herself a tired-out sort of laugh without buoyancy. Flushed, a little flushed, she repeated to herself. I hope so, indeed, a little. Her eyelashes were wet. Antonia, in her corner, moaned and giggled, and it was impossible to tell where the moans ended and the giggles began. The mistress and the maid had been somewhat hysterical for Freya, on fleeing into her room, had found Antonia there, and had told her everything. I have avenged you, my girl, she exclaimed, and then they had laughingly cried, and crying laughed with admonitions. Shh, not so loud. Be quiet on one part, and interludes of, I am so frightened, he's an evil man, on the other. Antonia was very much afraid of Heemskirk. She was afraid of him because of his personal appearance, because of his eyes, and his eyebrows, and his mouth, and his nose, and his limbs. Nothing could be more rational, and she thought him an evil man, because, to her eyes, he looked evil. No ground for an opinion could be sounder. In the dimness of the room, with only a night light burning at the head of Freya's bed, the Camarista crept out of her corner to crouch at the feet of her mistress, supplicating in whispers. There's the brig, Captain Allen. Let us run away at once. Oh, let us run away. I am so frightened. Let us, let us. I run away, thought Freya to herself without looking down at the scared girl, never. Both the resolute mistress under the mosquito net and the frightened maid lying curled up on a mat at the foot of the bed did not sleep very well that night. The person that did not sleep at all was Lieutenant Heemskirk. He lay on his back, staring vindictively in the darkness, in flaming images and humiliating reflections, succeeded each other in his mind, keeping up, augmenting his anger. A pretty tale this to get about, but it must not be allowed to get about. The outrage had to be swallowed in silence. A pretty affair, fooled, led on, and struck by the girl, and probably fooled by the father, too. But no, Nielsen was but another victim of that shameless hussy, that brazen minx, that sly, laughing, kissing, lying. No, he did not deceive me on purpose, thought the tormented lieutenant. But I should like to pay him off all the same, for being such an imbecile. Well, some day, perhaps. One thing he was firmly resolved on, he had made up his mind to steal early out of the house. He did not think he could face the girl without going out of his mind with fury. Fire and perdition, ten thousand devils, I shall choke here 
before the morning, he muttered to himself, lying rigid on his back on old Nelson's bed, his breast heaving for air. He arose at daylight and started cautiously to open the door. Faint sounds in the passage alarmed him, and remaining concealed, he saw Freya coming out. This unexpected sight deprived him of all power to move forward from the crack of the door. It was the narrowest crack possible but commanding the view of the end of the veranda. Freya made for that end hastily to watch the brig passing the point. She wore her dark dressing gown. Her feet were bare, because, having fallen asleep towards the morning, she ran out headlong in her fear of being too late. Heemskirk had never seen her looking like this, with her hair drawn back smoothly, to the shape of her head, and hanging in one heavy, fair tress down her back, and with that air of extreme youth, intensity, and eagerness. And at first he was amazed, and then he gnashed his teeth. He could not face her at all. He muttered a curse, and kept still behind the door. With a low and deep breathed ah, when she first saw the brig already under way, she reached for Nelson's long glass reposing on brackets high up the wall. The wide sleeve of the dressing gown slipped back, uncovering her white arm as far as the shoulder. Heemskirk, gripping the door handle as if to crush it, felt like a man just risen to his feet from a drinking bout. And Freya knew that he was watching her. She knew. She had seen the door move as she came out of the passage. She was aware of his eyes being on her, with scornful bitterness, with triumphant contempt. You are there, she thought, leveling the long glass. Oh well, look on then. The green eyelets appeared like black shadows. The ashen sea was smooth as glass. The clearer robe of the colorless dawn, in which even the brig appeared shadowy, had a hem of light in the east. Directly, Freya had made out Jasper on deck, with his own long glass directed to the bungalow. She laid hers down, and raised both her beautiful white arms above her head. In that attitude of supreme cry, she stood still, glowing, with the consciousness of Jasper's adoration going out to her figure, held in the field of his glass away there, and warmed, too, by the feeling of evil passion, the burning, covetous eyes of the other fastened on her back. In the fervor of her love, in the caprice of her mind, and with that mysterious knowledge of masculine nature women seem to be born to, she thought, you are looking on, you will, you must, then you shall see something. She brought both her hands to her lips, then she flung them out, sending a kiss over the sea, as if she wanted to throw her heart along with it on the deck of the brig. Her face was rosy, her eyes shone, her repeated passionate gesture seemed to fling kisses by the hundred again and again while the slowly ascending sun brought the glory of color to the world turning the islets green the sea blue the brig below her white dazzling white and the spread of her wings with the red ensign streaming like a tiny flame from the peak and each time she murmured with a rising inflection, Take this, and this, and this, till suddenly her arms fell. She had seen the ensign dipped in response, and next moment the point below hid the hull of the brig from her view. Then she turned away from the balustrade, and passing slowly before the door of her father's room, with her eyelids lowered and an enigmatic expression on her face, she disappeared behind the curtain. 
but instead of going along the passage, she remained concealed and very still on the other side to watch what would happen. For some time, the broad, furnished veranda remained empty. Then the door of old Nelson's room came open suddenly, and Heemskirk staggered out. His hair was rumpled, his eyes bloodshot, his unshaven face looked very dark. He gazed wildly about, saw his cap on a table, snatched it up, and made for the stairs quietly, but with a strange, tottering gait, like the last effort of waning strength. Shortly after his head had sunk below the level of the floor, Freya came out from behind the curtain with compressed, scheming lips and no softness at all in her luminous eyes. He could not be allowed to sneak off scot-free. Never, never. She was excited. She tingled all over. She had tasted blood. He must be made to understand that she had been aware of having been watched. He must know that he had been seen slinking off shamefully. But to run to the front rail and shout after him would have been childish, crude, undignified. And to shout what? What word? What phrase? No, it was impossible. Then how? She frowned, discovered it, dashed at the piano which had stood open all night, and made the rosewood monster growl savagely in an irritated bass. She struck chords as if firing shots after that straddling broad figure in ample white trousers and a dark uniform jacket with gold shoulder straps, and then she pursued him with the same thing she had played the evening before, a modern, fierce piece of love music, which had been tried more than once against the thunderstorms of the group. She accentuated its rhythm with triumphant malice, so absorbed in her purpose that she did not notice the presence of her father, who, wearing an old threadbare ulster of a check pattern over his sleeping suit, had run from the back veranda to inquire the reason of this untimely performance. He stared at her. What on earth? Freya! His voice was nearly drowned by the piano. What's become of the lieutenant? he shouted. She looked up at him as if her soul were lost in her music with unseeing eyes. Gone. What? Where? She shook her head slightly and went on playing louder than before. Old Nelson's innocently anxious gaze, starting from the open door of his room, explored the whole place, high and low, as if the lieutenant were something small, which might have been crawling on the floor or clinging to a wall. But a shrill whistle coming somewhere from below pierced the ample volume of sound rolling out of the piano in great vibrating waves. The lieutenant was down at the cove, whistling for the boat to come and take him off to his ship, and he seemed to be in a terrific hurry, too, for he whistled again almost directly, waited for a moment, and then set out a long, interminable, shrill call, as distressful to hear as though he had shrieked without drawing a breath. Freya ceased playing. Suddenly, going on board, said old Nelson, perturbed by the event. What could have made him clear out so early? Queer chap. Devilishly touchy, too. I shouldn't wonder if it was your conduct last night that hurt his feelings. I noticed you, Freya. You as well as laughed in his face while he was suffering agonies from neuralgia. It isn't the way to get yourself liked. He's offended with you. Freya's hands now reposed passive on the keys. She bowed her fair head, feeling a sudden discontent, a nervous lassitude, as though she had passed through some exhausting crisis. Old Nelson, looking aggrieved, was resolving matters of policy in his bald head. 
I think it would be right for me to go on board just to inquire sometime this morning, he declared fussily. Why don't they bring me my morning tea? Do you hear, Freya? You have astonished me, I must say. I didn't think a young girl could be so unfeeling. And the lieutenant thinks himself a friend of ours, too. What? No. Well, he calls himself a friend, and that's something to a person in my position. Certainly. Oh, yes, I must go on board. Must you? murmured Freya listlessly, then added in her thought, Poor man.